everybody and welcome to Database Camp. My name is Sarah and I'm going to be reading the second excerpt in the book I referenced in my first video, Racism in America. It is entitled Soul by Soul, Life Inside the Antebellum Slave Market by Walter Johnson. A little summary about Walter Johnson. Taking us inside the New Orleans slave market, the largest in the nation, where 100,000 men women and children were packaged, priced, and sold. Walter Johnson transforms the statistics of this chilling trade into the human drama of traders, buyers, and slaves. Depicting the subtle interrelation of capitalism, paternalism, class consciousness, racism, and resistance in the slave market, he illuminates the centrality of the peculiar institution which altered the lives of everyone involved in it. Here the author brings us inside the slave pens, where traders turned human beings into products for sale. In the daily practice of the slave pens, slaves were treated as physical manifestations of the categories the traders used to select their slaves. Number one, second rate, and so on. After gathering individuals into categories and attributing those categories an independent existence in the slave market by which they could be compared to all other categories and all other goods, the traders turned those categories around and used them to evaluate the individuals of whom they were supposedly composed. Thus could slave trader J. M. Wilson walk into a Louisiana courtroom declare himself familiar with the prices of slaves in this market, that is, with the price categories that traders use to do their business, and testify to the value of Clarissa and her family without ever having seen them. Similarly, slave trader J. W. Bozeman could testify to the value of Negroes brought about September 1851. In supporting a slaveholder's claim that the death of a woman he owned at the hands of a careless contractor had cost him a thousand dollars. Thus could slave trader David Wise testify to the value of a human eye. Being asked if the girl had a filter on her eye, if it would impair her value, he says it would impair its value from twenty-five dollars to forty dollars. In switching the pronoun from her to it, Wise revealed, in a word, what his business was about, turning people into prices. He used the tables of aggregates which reflected the market valuation of people to project the valuation. The price tables made traders like Bozeman and Wise capable of extraordinary feats of comparison but it was their daily business to guide the buyers beyond comparison to selection, to get them to single out the one slave especially suited to their purposes from the many nominally similar slaves available in the market. In the daily practices of the slave pens, then, real slaves had a double relation to the abstract market in the traders' imaginations. On the one hand, they were to be transformed into exemplars of the category to which they had been assigned. But once the categories of comparison had been established and embodied, the slaves were supposed to become once again visible as individuals, comparable to all of those who inhabited the same category, yet different enough to attract a buyer's eye and seal the sale. This daily dialectic of categorization and differentiation was the magic by which the traders turned people into things and then into money. Traders began to package their slaves for market before they ever reached the slave pens. As they neared their destination, the traders removed the heavy chains and galling cuffs from their slaves' arms and legs and allowed the slaves to wash and rest and heal. The traders shaved men's beards and combed their hair. They plucked gray hairs or blackened them with dye. The blacking 
that appears in their account books was perhaps intended for this purpose. Slave traders John White was clear about what he did with the tallow he bought. It was for the girl's hair. The rituals of preparation continued once slaves had reached the market. In the slave pens, the traders increased rations of bacon, milk, and butter, a fattening diet one trader referred to as feeding up. To keep the slaves' muscles toned, the traders set them to dancing and exercising, and to make their skin shine with the appearance of health. The traders greased the slaves' faces with sweet oil or washed them in greasy water. The traders also hired doctors to visit their pens regularly. Scarcely a day passes, but would I go to his establishment, it being on the road to my office, testified Dr. J. H. Lewis of J. M. Wilson's slave pen. Dr. John Carr spoke similarly of the slave yard owned by Hope H. Slater in the 1840s, is generally in the habit of calling there and sitting for an hour in the afternoon. He usually visited all the slaves. When Slater's yard passed into the possession of Bernard and Walter Campbell, Carr continued as the yard's doctor, was the attending physician at Campbell's establishment, is in the habit of visiting Campbell's establishment two or three times a day. These accounts may be exaggerated, for these doctors had as much experience in the courts as they did in the slave market, and it was part of their ongoing business relation that the traders to emphasize the good care received by slaves in the pens. But even if they overstated the frequency and quality of their slave market ministrations, it is clear that six slaves in the pens often received professional treatment. At the time of his death and estate settlement, slave dealer Elihu Cresswell was carrying debts for having slaves' teeth pulled and provided them with medicine. In his account, book John White recorded the $25 he paid a physician to look after his slaves in 1845, and regularly noted prescriptions and treatment for slaves in the pens, chloride of lime, capsules, cupping, medicine. The New Orleans slave yards kept by Cresswell and Benjamin Screws both had separate rooms set aside for the sick. Fear of contagion more than charity might have motivated the traitor's concern, but the separation of the sick was often accompanied by medical care. Frank, for example, was nursed back to health from yellow fever in slave dealer Calvin Rutherford's private house, and Solomon Northrup was treated for smallpox in the hospital, as according to an 1841 city law all slaves suffering from infectious disease were to be. In the slave pens, however, medical treatment was a trick of the trade, nothing more. These expenditures were speculations like any others the traders made, tactical commitments to slaves' bodies that were underwritten by the hope of their sale. When the hope ran out, so seemingly did the traders concern. John White's reckoning of his chances of curing and selling Harriet, for instance, can be tracked through the pages of his account book. Capsules for Harriet on February 3rd, cupping Harriet on the 5th, burial of her child on the 14th, brandy for Harriet on the 16th, burial for Harriet on the 19th, the sale of Harriet's surviving children on the 21st, Harriet was treated when it seemed possible to save her, comforted or quieted with alcohol when it did not, and buried when she died. Her children, less valuable than she had been, were not treated at all and were quickly sold when their care became the trader's responsibility and their presence in the yard a threat to his other property. There was always an alternative to caring for sick slaves, selling them quickly. Their bodies prepared, 
the slaves in the pens were packaged for sale. The traders' account books document their extensive daily attention to presentation, entries for dresses, shoes, stockings, and head coverings for the women, suits with undershirts, drawers, socks, boots, and sometimes a hat for the men. In October of 1857, John White bought 40 identical blue suits for the men in his yard. The clothes masked differences among the slaves, individual pasts and potential problems were covered over in uniform cloth. The sick and the well, those from far away and those from nearby, the eager, the unattached and the angry, all looked alike in the trader's window-dressed version of slavery. The clothes suggested not only comparability, but also cleanliness and chastity. Iyer Crow's famous drawing of slaves, lined out for sale in New Orleans, shows women with long-sleeved blouses and covered heads, men in black suits with top hats, noting the kerchiefs tied around their heads in a mode peculiar to the negress. Northern writer Joseph Ingram pronounced the women he saw in the market extremely neat and tidy. Their appearance had little of the repulsiveness we are apt to associate with the slaves, wrote Robert Chambers, another northern visitor to the slave pens. None of the poverty and toil that characterized the daily life of American slaves, none of the bareness that contributed so powerfully to the historical sexualization of black bodies was immediately apparent in the slave market. These people were dressed as ideal slaves, exaggerated in the typicality of their appearance, too uniform, too healthy, too clean. Through the daily practice of the pens, individual slaves were turned into physical symbols of their own saleability. Nothing else about them was immediately apparent, except for the occasional whim or fancy. On the same page of the ledger book in which he recorded the prices of the steel rings and chains which he used to shackle the limbs of his slaves on the way south, Floyd Whitehead noted his purchases of the three gold rings and half dozen plated ones he placed on their fingers when he sent them to market. John White bought a cravat and a boy's fancy suit in 1857. In early years he had bought trimmings for men's pants and a shawl for a woman he was taking to Mobile to be sold. A.J. Walker sent enslaved women to sail wearing gloves. These conceits were meant to draw a buyer's eye as he scanned a line of slaves. To suggest uncommon gentility, a paternalism of the his master's clothes variety, or an exotic fantasy, these obviously contrived appearances, self-revealing in their pretense, both perplexed the buyer's gaze and invited further investigation. Their bodies treated and dressed, the slaves were turned out for sale, divided by sex, men on one side, women on the other. The phrase runs through descriptions of the slave market like a late motif. Here may be seen husbands separated from wives by only the width of the room, and children from parents, one or both, wrote John Brown, re-envisioning the family ties that were erased by the trader's practice. Even when the traders kept track of family ties, they often severed them in the slave market. Of the seven slaves bracketed with the label Overton Purchase in John White's slave record for 1846, two were sold together, one sent home as unsaleable, and the rest sold individually in Louisiana, Tennessee, and Alabama. Families were likewise carefully bracketed on the bill of lading for a shipment of slaves received by Scrafham Kakulu in the winter of 1836. 
but they were indiscriminately separated as Kukulu sold them over the course of the spring. Kukulu's account book record of the buyers of his divided slaves is a testament to the commitment of his employees to his instructions, that price might be the guide and to sell for the best of his interests. That meant selling slaves the way the buyers wanted them, according to sex-specific demand rather than according to family ties. The lengths to which slave traders could go in dismantling and repackaging slave families in the image of the market were limited by Louisiana law. The original Code Noir forbade the separation by sale of children under the age of 10 from their mothers, and in 1829 the law was explicitly extended to outlaw the importation of thusly separated slaves. While the 1829 law should not be ignored, it is a good example of slaveholders negotiating a hard bargain with their own consciences and of the tendency of paternalism to limit its already meager promises to protection of the very young. Its effect should not be overemphasized. What the law did was to give legal credence to the categories according to which slave traders did their business, who, after all, would favor a trade in motherless children, not the slave traders. The vast majority of family separating sales occurred in the Upper South, out of the effective reach of the law, and the vast majority of these involved the removal of the parent. Slave traders, especially those who traveled long distances, had little use for small children. By the 1850s, a single woman became a featured category of trade. Orphaned children became a recognizable portion of the population in Upper South slave communities. Trader John White left four of Mary Cole's children, aged two to ten, behind when he took Cole and her three older children to New Orleans in 1846. Trader J. W. Bozeman explained a similar choice this way. Servants are less valuable with children than without. But if the traders wanted to trade in children who had been separated from their mothers, there was little to keep them from adhering to the letter of the law by making orphans rather than finding them. It is hard to read slave trader David Wise's statement that witness has often sold little children without wondering about his own role in the qualification he quickly added, who had lost their mother. The 1829 law then provided the maximal rhetorical effect with the minimal practical distribution of the slave trade. It stripped the slave family of its existing members, their history, their ties and affinities, and substituted a more saleable definition, a mother and a young child. As well as packaging the slaves into saleable lots, the traders packed them into racial categories. By the time they turned their slaves out for sale, the traders had transformed the market categories they used to talk to one another into the racial categories they used to talk to the buyers. In their back and forth market reports, the traders described slaves as prime, number one, number two, and so on. But on 90% of the acts of sale recorded by New Orleans notaries, they used words like Negro, Greif, Mulatto, or Quadroon. These words were explicitly biological. They bespoke pasts that were not visible in the slave market by referring to parents and grandparents who had been left behind with old owners, but they did so by referring to something that the buyers would be able to see, skin color. Brushed, dressed, and polished, divided by sex, or lamely protected by law, assigned a new history and a racial category. The people in the pens were lined out for sale by height. The men were arranged on one side of the room, the women on the other, 
the tallest were placed at the head of the row, then the next tallest, and so on, in order of their respective heights, remembered Solomon Northrop. Around the walls of the slave pens, the slaves were arranged to reflect the traders' buyer-tracking tables. As the slaves were hectored into line at the beginning of every day, there were no husbands or wives apparent among them, no old lovers or new friends. They were only men and women, field hands and house servants, negro, grife, and mulatto, tall, medium, and short. Having done all they could to make real people represent the constructed categories of the marketplace, the traders began to try to turn them into money. Value in the slave market emerged out of the play of similarity with difference. The choice of one slave from among many similar slaves made a sale. To sell a slave, the traders had to peel back their own representations of commodified similarity and slip beneath them a suggestion of personal distinction that would make one slave stand out to a buyer who was trying to distinguish himself from all the other buyers in the market. The traders had to make a pitch. In the slave pens, the traders pitched their slaves by telling stories that seemed to individualize and even humanize the depersonalized slaves. They breathed the life of the market into the bodies, histories, and identities of the people they were trying to sell by using a simulacrum of human singularity to do the work of product differentiation. The trader's reputation for buying the sick and malign on the cheap only to sell them at premium prices made it important for the traders to explain why the slaves were in the market in the first place, such as sold for no fault of their own. This unasked for excuse had specific variants, all of which shifted attention from slaves to their former owners from an advertisement. The owner of the following named valuable slaves being on the eve of departure for Europe. From Edward Sparrow's account of why he sent a man later alleged to have been alcoholic to be sold in the slave market. Mr. Sparrow expressed a wish that he should be sold here where his wife was from the pitch made by a trader for a slave who had been once returned. The party to whom he was sold had no fault except that the man was too much of a French cook. From the explanation made by a trader about a man later alleged to have been once returned to him as a thief, drunkard, and runaway, did not take him back because he was a bad negro, but because Forbes, the first buyer, was unable to pay for him. From a trader's account of why Jane, who was allegedly consumptive, had been returned after her first sale. She was not a hairdresser. The lady was not pleased with her. That is the only reason I heard for not keeping the girl. These stories were neither wholly believable nor easily disproven. The former owners to whom they referred all questions were distant in time and space, unavailable to offer their own account. As a warranty, the stories were useless. The traders were bound only by the stories they wrote down and signed. But as a warning to buyers, the pitches were perhaps more useful. The slaves' histories, not quite visible behind the shimmering tales told in the slave pens, belong to the traders. Some of the stories the traders told were quite simple, advertisements that were put forward as qualifications, accounts of past work through which buyers could view a certain future, first-rate cotton picker, experienced drayman, cooper, carpenter, cook, nurse, and so on. And some were more detailed, in the words of a slave trader's handbill, Bill Negroman, aged about 28 years, excelled servant and good pastry cook, or in the words of a witness to a trader's pitch, he said that said slave 
was a first-rate cook, a very good washer, and a good plate plain shirts very well, and that Mr. Hughes would be satisfied in every respect with having purchased said negress. However brief, these lists of skills refer to the experience and judgment of former owners to a past distant from the slave pens, but they insinuated themselves into the present as trustworthy representations of past experience, drawing whatever authenticity they had, enough to convince Mr. Hughes from the constant babble of talk about slaves that characterized the social life of southern slaveholders. The traders were taking hold of slaveholders' fantasies about the slave market, wrapping them around the slaves they had for sale, and selling them back to the buyers as indications of those buyers' own good fortune and discernment. And the traders' pitches went well beyond work. They could pin a detailed fantasy out of a list of supposed skills. Sarah, a mulatress, aged forty-five years, a good cook and accustomed to housework in general, is an excellent and faithful nurse for sick persons, and in every respect a first-rate character. Sarah, as sold, was gentility and paternalism embodied, good meals, a clean house, a companion who would wait faithfully by the bed of an ailing, vulnerable owner. Dennis, her son, a mulatto, aged twenty-four years, a first-rate cook and steward for a vessel, having been in that capacity for many years on board one of the mobile packets is strictly honest temperate and is a first-rate subject dennis would bring with him a hint of riverboat grandeur the plush seats and ornate surroundings the graceful service and extensive menu the pleasure of traveling first class and dennis was trustworthy he had worked on a boat but not run away he might be hired out or given the run of the house. His purchase would make good sense, his service would be in good taste, and though Dennis and his mother were put up for sale separately, they could be bought together by someone who cared enough to do so. The slave traders could line their families out separately and then knit them together again in the sales pitch. They could package and sell the negation of their own way of doing business by offering the buyers a chance to rejoin families that had been sundered in the market. Slave market paternalism thus replayed the plots of pro-slavery propaganda and fiction. The good-hearted slave at the side of the dying master, the slave who could be trusted to master himself, the slaveholders saving interventions in the life of the unfortunate slave. As representations of individual slaves, the traders' pitches drew their authenticity from slaveholders' shared fantasies of gentility, reciprocity, and salvation. The traders' stories helped the buyers to mirror their shared fantasies in the individual slaves who stood before them to imagine that they were distinguished themselves through the purchase of the slave they chose. There was a specific commercial variant to the slave sale story in which the traders set aside bargaining to give the buyer some inside advice. The Virginia slave trader who sold Eden said that he was so pleased with Eden that he put the slave to work in the slave pen. He continued his description of Eden's virtues, that is, saleability, by saying that the slave always rendered a correct account to his master, and he was never chastised, and it is a rare case when a slave is sent six months to sell without being chastised. Those who did not trust the traders' stories were sometimes allowed to take a peek into their business practice. James Blakeney literally opened his account books. Where else would a trader unmask himself but in the counting room? In trying to sell Mary Ellen Brooks to Bruckner Payne, Blakeney told Payne he would sell her for 600 thereby losing her clothing and shipping costs and exhibited a bill of lading to prove the price he had paid, making a similar pitch, 
slave trader David Wise exhibited his own incentives when he told Clarissa's buyers that he would dispose of the girl at a low price on account of her advanced state of pregnancy. At the time, Blakeney and Wise retold these slave market stories. They were in Louisiana courtrooms, being sued for knowing that the slaves they sold were mortally ill. In the courtroom, as in the slave market, the references to their own incentives were deployed by the traders to shield their motives from further scrutiny. Negro driver, Southern Yankee, Southern Shylock, they were called. What better proof of a trader's sincerity than an open account of what they had at stake? As they played their way back and forth between the stories told about every slave and the pitches they made for any slave, the traders sometimes had to refit their shop-worn pitches to specific circumstances. Apparent ills required careful narration. A cough in the slave market was evidence of a present cold or past sickness. Nothing serious, nothing incipient. Other ailments were similarly explained by being explained away. Sally's loose teeth, they could have been pulled out with a person's finger, were attributed to the excessive use of calomel. The fit Henry had been seen having in the street was a result of his pretending to be sick all the time. Lewis's ruined knee was described by the broker at a probate sale as a temporary twist received a few days previous while assisting others in covering a house. Phyllis's swollen leg was rheumatism, nothing. It had never interfered with her work. The swelling beneath Seraphine's skirt, which turned out to be a very large tumor, was described by the man selling her as evidence of her pregnancy. These were minor ailments, some regrettable like Henry's fake fits, some laudable like Lewis's willingness to endanger himself in helping others, but all temporary. All of these stories emphasize circumstances in explaining apparent irregularity, and all of them provided buyers with the opportunity to demonstrate their abilities in the choice of their slaves. A little treatment, a little discipline, in short, a little mastery, and these slaves would be as good as new. The traders, to be equally ready to spin unruly evidence of slaves' inward feelings back into the comforting conventions of pro-slavery rhetoric, when a woman who was missing two fingers mounted the stand in Richmond, the auctioneer quickly explained that the doctor had removed the first finger for a medical reason and she had herself cut off the second because it pained her. The disquieted specter of a woman who would choose to mutilate her hand rather than be sold was brushed over with the reassuring image of a slave so stupid and imitative that she would cut off one finger because the doctor had cut off another. Anton Reith, a visitor to New Orleans, remembered seeing a woman crying on the auction stand and recorded what he was able to learn about her in his diary. Her master was in debt and was obliged to sell her to pay some mortgage. She had always lived with the family. She was about 35 years old. Her grief, to me, was heart-trending. She wept most bitterly. The loyal slave sold for her owner's debts. Whether or not the story Reef recorded was true, it was effective. The woman's tears became part of the auctioneer's pitch, and Anton Reef standing in the slave market, felt his heart rent by a convention of pro-slavery paternalism. All of these stories may have been believed by the traders who told them. Most of them may have been true, but their veracity is less important than their form. The traders' stories, redolent with the comforting commonplaces of slaveholding culture, guided the buyer's eyes to what they were supposed to see. The slave trader's story suggested that the buyer of a particular slave 
would be a man with a sharp eye for the main chance or a taste for the exceptional or a singular capacity to do right. As they package their slaves and stories about the distant past, the traders were telegraphing suggestive accounts of the slaveholding futures that were for sale in the pens. Along with the virtues of their slaves, the traders were scripting those of their buyers. Some of the people the traders sold were not slaves at all. Eulalie had been living as free for decades when she, her six children, and ten grandchildren were taken by force from their home in Ponte Coupe, Louisiana, sold at auction in New Orleans, and then placed in a slave pen for safekeeping. Euphemi and her seven children were held in a New Orleans slave pen, advertised for sale in the New Orleans Bee, and sold at public auction. She had been living as a free person for over 20 years. Though they lost years of their life to the slave traders, these women and their families had nearby friends and relatives who could help them reconstruct their histories and successfully sue to have their freedom restored on the grounds that whatever claim there was to their ownership had long since lapsed through disuse. The hopes of other free people sold as slaves, however, were even more attenuated. The shades of legality in which the traders dealt sometimes crossed into outright kidnapping. The list of those who managed to send word out of slavery must stand as a partial list of the kidnapped. John Mary, a free man from Illinois, was arrested as a slave in St. Louis and shipped to New Orleans to be sold. Solomon Northrup, a free man from New York, was lured with lies and to Washington drugged, threatened with death, and put on a boat for New Orleans, where he was sold in the yard of slave dealer Theophilus Freeman. Albert Young was freed by his Alabama owner's will, but nevertheless carried to New Orleans by the will's executor and sold to the New Orleans dealers McRae, Kaufman and Co. John Weasley Dunn, another free man, was charged with stealing an old coat in Baltimore, jailed, sold to slave dealer Hope H. Slater, and carried to New Orleans, where he was sold again. Messages sent by Mary and Northrop reached their friends, and they were freed from slavery through the intervention of the courts. Young's suit also reached the courts but his freedom was voided on the grounds that his emancipation was not legal under Alabama law. The letter Dunn sent for help may never have reached his father to whom it was addressed. None of these stolen people could have been sold if their histories were known, so they were sold with new ones. These were only the most extreme cases of the creative power of the trader's market practice or at least they seem the most extreme, because lying about a slave's origins seems more abject than ignoring them. Selling a person under an uncertain title seems more mendacious than selling with a clear title, and kidnapping a free person seems more shocking than selling a slave. But the extremity of these stories represents the regularity of what slave traders did every day for 400 years. What they did hundreds of thousands of times during the antebellum period. Just as kidnapping made slaves of free people, the traders packaging created slaves who did not previously exist out of the pieces of people who formerly did. By detaching slaves from their history, and replacing human singularity with fashioned saleability, the traders were doing more than selling slaves. They were making them. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. 
Make sure to put your opinions down in the comments. I want to hear your thoughts on these stories down below. So thank you again so much for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and please subscribe to the channel because I would really appreciate it. I'll see you guys again very soon. Bye.